it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Monique Ingalls as our speaker this evening. Monique is based at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. She's married to Jason, who is an Episcopal minister, and they have two young daughters. Those of us who know Monique will testify to the warmth and wisdom she brings into each conversation, and it's been a real pleasure to welcome her into our community today. We're grateful for what she's already brought in this morning's chapel and this afternoon's seminar. In fact, one person commented after chapel that if Monique just delivered that same talk three times today, he'd be very happy. <laughs> Quite apt, given its focus on repetition. I feel like it's, do it again, Monique. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube and that will make sense. I'm sure we can look forward to an equally insightful and engaging lecture this evening. As 2022 marks 25 years of the Music and Worship Department at LST, it seemed an opportune time to hear from a leading scholar in Christian congregational music. In this evening's lecture, Monique will examine the meaning and value of the local and the global within musical worship. This is a pertinent topic in today's era of globalization, where our local worship expressions frequently draw from and are often shaped by globally circulating repertoires. I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say on the topic, and I'm sure we'll all leave here with practical insights and fresh perspectives on musical worship. I highly commend Monique to you as a scholar who trails an impressive portfolio of accomplishments. In fact, her reputation often precedes her. I first heard about Monique through my doctoral supervisor, who expressed much bemusement at how on earth she manages to get so much done. After completing a bachelor's degree in music from John Brown University and a PhD in the anthropology of music from the University of Pennsylvania, Monique spent three years at the University of Cambridge as a postdoctoral teaching fellow, where she won a Teaching Excellence Award for being an outstanding lecturer. From 2014 to 2015, she was a senior research fellow and visiting assistant pro professor at Yale University's Institute of Sacred Music. She's currently Associate Professor of Music and Director of Research and Graduate Programs at the Centre for Christian Music Studies at Baylor University. Monique is the author of Singing the Congregation, How Contemporary Worship Music Forms Evangelical Community, and that's published with Oxford University Press. She's also co-editor of five additional books on congregational singing, and works currently in progress, I believe, if I don't have this wrong, Monique, include a book entitled British Gospel Choirs Representing Race and Resounding Religion in 21st Century Britain, which I'm sure will be of interest to many of us here when that comes out. As well as being a researcher and a teacher, Monique is an excellent network builder. She co-founded the Christian Congregational Music Local and Global Perspectives Conference, a biennial gathering that draws scholars from around the world and across a variety of disciplines. And this is something that LST Music faculty, and I'm sure others here as well, have had the pleasure of participating in. Monique serves as the senior series editor of the Congregational Music Studies book series from Routledge Press, which publishes scholarly books about congregational music making from interdisciplinary and international perspectives. As a musician, she trained classically in piano and choral singing, but also has experience playing Javanese gamelan, singing traditional polyphony from the Republic of Georgia, and playing keyboards for a cover band. So quite an all-round musician. Monique enjoys participating in and leading church music in a variety of styles, including pop rock, folk, classical, and gospel. And she served most recently as interim music liturgist and choir director for Holy Spirit's Episcopal Church in Waco, Texas. This evening's lecture will draw from case studies of music from uh, four continents. And in fact, Monique has been very busy this year uh, with traveling. She's done trips to Brazil, to Nigeria, and to the UK. And she's now coming to the end of a month-long stint here in the UK. So I know she's really looking forward to returning home soon. We're extremely grateful that she uh, uh, elongated her trip, especially to be here for Lang Lecture. It truly is an honor to have her with us. Please would you join me in welcoming Dr. Monique Ingalls.
Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, it is truly an honor and a delight uh, to be with you all this evening. Uh, when I was asked a few months ago to deliver this talk, uh, my first response was excitement, elation. They want me to give a named lecture. Ah! <laughs> Um, but as I told students in chapel this morning, my second reaction was panic. Um, so you've had a, a series of incredibly distinguished speakers over the 40 years of this lectureship, and stepping into this amazing lineup is uh, more than a bit daunting. But the one who has promised is faithful, and I've prayed that God's purposes will be accomplished in and through my words this evening. So I am inviting us um, tonight to think, uh, for you to think with me about what it means for Christianity to be a local expression and a global faith in today's world. We know that, of course, since the very beginning of Christianity, Christian beliefs and worship practices have taken root readily within a range of contexts, from metropoles to the margins of world societies. Our era has seen a rapid increase at this, of the speed at which people, ideas, and practices move. The music of Christian worship today is one of those fast-moving practices. With new songs moving rapidly from Sydney to Seoul, from Lagos to London. This fast-moving worship music, which brings along with it a range of theological and cultural um, associations, has had a strong impact on Christian identity. This rapid spread of ideas and practices often creates challenges for Christians as we seek to live faithfully and follow Christ. So tonight we will explore together the meaning and value of both local and global within musical worship, focusing in specifically on Pentecostalism. This evening we are also in for a very special treat. Uh, we will be led in um, some music by the wonderful LST Choir, led by um, Geraldine Laddie Luce, and I'm so grateful for you, you all being here. And then, uh, so after we hear the choir sing, we will examine studies of Pentecostal music making, and I managed, I know I said four continents, but I'm gonna make it five, um, from five continents to examine an emerging pattern, what I am calling, per the title of the talk, local praise, and global worship. And then finally, we will critically reflect on the implications of local praise and global worship in order to discern how to respond faithfully as God's representatives to our globalizing world. So I'm aware that tonight we come from a variety of theological and, and faith traditions. And so my case study will come from the musical worship songs and practices of Pentecostal Christianity. I am not a Pentecostal Christian myself, though I have been challenged by what I've learned and have found it highly relevant within my own Episcopal Church and Baptist University um, contexts. So it's my hope that those of us within, outside, or somewhere adjacent to Pentecostalism will find the insights relatable and the questions um, pertinent to our own traditions. Because of Pentecostalism's worldwide spread and remarkable growth to over half a billion adherents in less than a hundred years, Pentecostalism has been described as the ideal laboratory for studying the spread of ideas and practices globally. We probably all know from personal experience that many Christian congregations around the world have been Pentecostalized over the last 30 to 40 years. Most of my Baptist University students in the United States cannot remember a time before raising hands was common in their churches. It comes as a shock to them that until sometime in the 1980s, 1990s, most Baptist churches would have frowned on the practice. So despite the centrality of music to Pentecostalism, for many decades it was at the margins of scholarship on the movement. However, after many years of inattention, I'm pleased to say there is now a burgeoning body of scholarship on Pentecostal music making. What is still missing, however, is a robust comparative account that aggregates the findings of these many fine, in-depth, local or regional studies to discern what, if any, patterns emerge. 
So that is our task this evening, to identify and tease out a pattern that seems to be emerging within the context of global Pentecostal music making. As we get started, I want to make evident to you some of the mental models of music that I and most others in my field are working with. These theories may at first seem, yet they might seem on the one hand obvious, on the other maybe they seem strange, possibly even controversial. So isn't it obvious to everyone what music is? As we will see, not necessarily. So the first model relates to music and language. How many times have you heard, or maybe even said yourself, that music is a universal language? I'm going to kindly suggest that you don't say that anymore. And I'll give you, I'll even give you a short statement to replace it with, which should, be, yeah, I'll say on this slide. So music is not a universal language, but music like language is universal. Just like there are a myriad of languages, so also are there an astounding variety of musics around the globe. Many of these share aspects in common because of a shared history and because of the way music now travels as a commodity very quickly um, through our global marketplace. So we know that Western media, like the English language, has penetrated a vast swath um, of the world. This is why people in far-flung places intuitively understand what we could call the musical grammar of orchestral music, film music, and pop music. But what we might call musical vernaculars are alive and well in many places. Many musicians around the world are bi or trilingual by necessity. Um, I think of a tenor um, that I saw at the Barbican on just this Sunday who was an accomplished opera singer or operatic um, vocalist, but could turn his voice on a dime and do gospel runs and riffs by musical there. Still, many more of us are capable of code switching between different dialects of a musical language. So I grew up in a rural area of the southern United States, and I was the only child I knew of in my entire community to study classical piano. My working class and middle class family members encouraged me, but in various, mostly subtle ways, you know, made it apparent that Bach and Beethoven and Brahms was highbrow music. This was not our music. They made it clear that what they enjoyed me playing the most <laughs> were hymn arrangements or songs from film or radio. So I grew up with an acute awareness that classical music was not our music, but that certain kinds of popular folk and church music were. So the second model that I want to present to you is an ontology of music. In other words, what music is in its essence. So um, people from my field would say music is, at its heart, is fundamentally a social practice rather than being notes on a page or sounds from a recording or something that springs fully formed from the mind of a creative genius. Just like language, music is a way humans relate to each other and to God. Notes on a page are a musical artifact, the medium that conveys instructions for this social practice, getting from one person to another. So are recordings and YouTube videos. And music's creation is irreducibly social. Even so-called creative geniuses have spent thousands of hours learning and honing their craft in the presence of and or for the enjoyment of others. So how music as a social practice relates to an understanding of music as theology is the subject of a whole other conversation. Have me back in 10 years and we can talk about that. No. Um, it's one that is fascinating and ongoing. And so I'm not going to delve as much into that particular conversation in my talk, but I'm happy to engage um, questions during the, the Q&A period. So the foundational ideas that undergird this talk are music, like language, is universal. And secondly, that music is fundamentally a social practice. One important implication of these theories, of these mental models, is that all music matters. Not just music by famous people, or music that is incredibly old, or music that is astoundingly popular. If music is fundamentally a social practice, 
our question becomes, what can we learn about people through music? For Christians, this becomes, what can we learn about the people that God loves, however difficult they may be for us to love sometimes? How can we use music to better understand the people made in God's image and likeness who, however far they've fallen, live in hope of redemption? So with those foundations laid, let's now have some music to set the groundwork for the rest of the lecture this evening. The wonderful Geraldine, Laddie Luce, and the LST Choir are going to lead us in singing, and this will give us a nice sonic reference for the discussion to follow. All right. Well, so in singing together just now or listening, um, we experienced an activity that Pentecostals and many other types of Christians would refer to as worship. We're going to be step, taking a step back this evening from prescriptive theology, so what worship should be, while of course acknowledging the importance of this discussion. Instead, we're gonna spend a few minutes looking at Pentecostal worship like musical anthropologists, trying to understand what many within this group understand worship to be. What we find quickly is that the word worship is more complicated within Pentecostalism than it might first appear. Most of us are probably aware that Pentecostal charismatic gatherings the world over start with a long period of, quote, worship, a time of response and connection to God where participatory singing is a key activity. This time of worship often includes dancing, exhortation, spoken prayer, prophetic words, and speaking in tongues. During Pentecostal worship, instrumentalists and singers lead the gathered assembly in a continuous string of songs for anywhere between 20 minutes and two hours or more. So worship in this Pentecostal context is usually regarded as distinct from other parts of the gathering or the service, which typically consist of preaching and a time for response or prayer ministry after the message. I'll say if, if I could get my slide back for, so this is kind of, it's, you know, 20 years old now, but it's still like the, the best, kind of the most, um, uh, you know, painting with broad brush strokes here. So the Pentecostal service at the bottom, you've got the flowing praise service, you know, where you've got the song, 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 prayer, song, 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 song. This, this is what I'm talking about, right? That whole period that is in, encompassed by the oval is, um, you know, is what many Pentecostals call the time of worship, unlike the various forms of the hymn sandwich that you see, um, that you see up, uh, up above it. So in many Pentecostal gatherings, worship can be further parsed into two other distinct activities, praise and confusingly worship. So in this second sense, worship refers to particular kinds of devotional activities that frequently happen during the second part of the time that is also called as a whole worship, the, the activity as a whole. So in their um, detailed history of contemporary worship, liturgical historians Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim write that a technical distinction between praise and worship began to emerge in the 1970s when influential North American Pentecostal authors settled upon a series of biblical typologies from the Old Testament to describe their practices. Some of you may be very familiar with these, perhaps have learned them or taught them. This may be new to others from outside this tradition. But they use these typologies as models of how to put songs together to create flowing sense leading to a sense of entering into God's presence. And that's a quote from um, Lim and, uh, uh, and Ruth. These authors conceived of worship in this first large general sense, as a metaphorical journey from the outer courts of the Jewish tabernacle or temple into the Holy of Holies. So, oh yes, I was going to say, and the, uh, uh, this model has led to, um, to others. I think it's the one before that one. 
the uh, slide before, there we go, yes. So um, according to this model, worshipers begin the progression at the temple gates. Here they gather collectively to praise God with jubilant, energetic, collectively focused song. As worshipers move into the inner courts of the tabernacle to the holy place, they experience a personal, intimate encounter with God. So this informed later Pentecostal models of worship like John Wimber's five or six, depending on when you're talking about, yeah, John Wimber, um, his model that's seen here. And you can even find this model of worship embedded within song lyrics. So let's look at a 1990s worship song, Awesome in This Place. So um, take a look at, um, the, oh, say the words I put in, uh, in bold, uh, as I come into your presence, you know, past the gates of praise into your sanctuary. This was the model that Dave Billington and that others had when they were, um, you know, when they were thinking about this. This was the, you know, kind of the dominant Pentecostal theology of worship. So to further dissect these ideas, let's look at some, um, some key notions from North American Pentecostal architects and popularizers of the theology and practice of praise and worship. Pastor and writer Bob Sorge differentiates praise from worship in terms of their primary orientation. Praise is oriented horizontally, he says, toward the worshiping community. Get the next slide. And um, while worship is directed vertically towards God. According to Sorge, praise is largely horizontal in its purpose, while worship is primarily a vertical interaction. Much happens on a horizontal level when we praise. We speak to one another, we declare God's praise before each other. But worship is more private and more preoccupied with the Godhead. Praise does have some vertical functions and worship has some horizontal elements, but these are not their primary directions." End quote. So another prominent pastor and writer, Judson Cornwall, describes the tabernacle model of worship where worshipers move from a time of jubilant praise in the outer courts to intimate worship in the holy place. And he says, quote, if the leader has been successful in bringing the people step by step into the outer court and on through it into the holy place, there will be a rise in the spiritual response of the people. Instead of mere soulish emotional responses, there will be responses from the human spirit that have depth and devotion in them. Clapping will likely be replaced with devotional responses of upturned faces, raised hands, tears, and even a subtler change in the timbre of the voices. When there is an awareness that we have come into the presence of God, we step out of lightness into sobriety." End quote. Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim call Cornwall a key conduit of praise and worship across Pentecostalism. And they note by the mid-1980s, Cornwall's books on worship had been published in French, German, Spanish, Dutch, and Chinese. Clearly, these ideas were not confined to North America or the United Kingdom. Rather, they spread rapidly and globally through worship conferences and charismatic networks in the 1980s and 1990s. Let's look at two examples of local adaptations of this framework. First, consider this description from Martina Prosen's study of several large Kenyan Pentecostal churches. Prosen notes that the songs at the beginning of the service are joyful and upbeat, while those towards the end of each worship session are more intimate and reflective. When speaking with the church pastors about the reasons for this ordering, Prosen writes that pastors, quote, refer to the tabernacle model when explaining the ritual sequencing of the first phase of the liturgy, and they highlight the way music is used to facilitate the progression of the outer courts to the Holy of Holies from celebration to adoration, end quote. Moving from an African to an Asian example, let's, let's consider this description from ethnomusicologist Connie Oyan Wong on a Chinese language Pentecostal worship music ministry. She says, quote, there are pr primarily three steps to achieve a closer encounter between God and his worshipers. First, entering from outside the tabernacle and coming through the gate, worshipers sing songs whose contents are thanksgiving and praise. This is called outer court worship. Second, worship leaders help prepare the congregation's hearts through proclaiming God's attributes in a worshiping mode. 
Third, the congregation enters into an intimate, deeper level of worship through singing songs about their personal relationship with God. This is called inner court worship. Lastly, certain songs, both slow and fast tempo, petitioning God's love and grace to be with the congregation throughout their spiritual journeys and declaring God's glory are used to round out the event. This is also the climax of worship called Holy of Holies. So we see the influence of this Pentecostal understanding of worship in the widespread and common compound category, praise and worship. And here I've put up for you, I'm not even gonna attempt to to, uh, pronounce most of these, but the compound term praise and worship is found in Spanish, alabanza y adoración, um, in Portuguese, in Korean, in Chinese, in um, Yoruba, I can't remember what all I put up there, in uh, Amharic, Igbo, Ghanaian English. So um, interestingly, the list could go on. In Korean and Chinese Christian communities, the word order of this compound phrase is reversed, translating to worship and praise instead of praise and worship. But despite the word ordering within many of these communities, praise still precedes worship. So we've seen how praise and worship are understood differently um, and have differing functions within uh, much Pentecostal worship. Praise precedes and prepares the heart for worship. As a result of their differing functions within Pentecostal worship as a whole, songs for praise and worship have different musical and lyrical characteristics. With regard to musical difference, the most obvious and audible difference between praise songs and worship songs is the rate at which music and movement unfold in time. Florian Carl, a scholar of Ghanaian Pentecostal music, makes the following observation about distinctions in tempo between praises and worship. Praises involve upbeat musical performances as well as congregational dance. Worship, on the other hand, features more solemn musical performances, sometimes unmetered or in slow duple or triple meter. Instead of dance and clapping, congregants sway their bodies, raising their arms upward in prayer or submitting themselves to God, kneeling down or lying on the floor. Speaking in tongues and prophecy typically occur during worship and tears often overcome congregants. Melvin Butler offers a strikingly similar description of the distinction between these forms of music making in Jamaica. While acknowledging that praise and worship is most often used as a compound phrase, Butler writes that, quote, the nouns praise and worship are sometimes taken separately and sometimes differentiated according to musical style. In this sense, praise is understood to be an up-tempo music that encourages dancing and hand clapping. In contrast, worship requires a more contemplative mode of musical participation, the purpose of which is to stir the heart of God and give him greater pleasure. During worship, Pentecostals may close their eyes and lift their arms while singing songs or speaking in tongues as a means of expressing adoration towards God. So the scholarly literature is replete with descriptions of distinctions between these, the fast songs, praise songs, giving way to slow songs, worship songs, within Pentecostal charismatic gatherings. As early as the 1970s, Ruth and Lim note that the slow versus fast distinction um, was being mapped onto praise versus worship against the complaints of some Pentecostal pastors that this equation was oversimplified. Scholars the world over remark upon the fast, slow pattern that so often characterizes praise and worship. From danceable alabanzas to the toned down songs of adoración in Cuban worship, from the upbeat Romani praise songs to the slower rom pop style worship songs in Hungary, to the move from rhythmic praise to reflective worship in the Nigerian diaspora, to exuberant praise to introspective worship within Chinese-speaking communities in Singapore and Malaysia. Though perhaps the most foundational element, tempo isn't the only musical characteristic that distinguishes praise 
songs from worship songs. Indeed, Carl's and Butler's brief accounts we saw moments ago gesture to several other differences within the musical performance. And so I made a table, not sure how well you can, you can see this, but kind of amalgamating the musical, lyrical, and performative characteristics presented um, to provide a summary of the basic distinction between praise and worship songs. As you'll see, praise songs tend to have more complex rhythms, including more percussive melody lines and more syncopation. These characteristics lend themselves to more exuberant bodily expressions, such as clapping and dancing. By contrast, worship songs are generally more rhythmically subdued, with tunes frequently characterized by expressive leaps, wide ranges, and longer sustained notes. Both praise and worship songs are typically in major keys, but the slower tempo of worship songs allow for lingering on some poignant, you know, kind of passing minor harmonies. So the liturgical and musical differences correspond to distinctions between praise and worship lyrics. Praise song lyrics are frequently joyful, celebratory, and communally focused, proclaiming and extolling God's power and describing or exhorting the community's response. While some praise songs declare God's attributes in the third person, in the form of proclamations about God's character and actions, he is holy, he has overcome, Others espouse the first person plural, we, so we bring the sacrifice of praise. These render the songs an expression of the worshiping community rather than the individual believer. Worship song lyrics, by contrast, are more often sung in the first person singular voice, I. Worship song lyrics are often described as intimate. They are personal prayers, generally from the individual believer, I rather than the communal we to God, expressing the believer's devotion to God, you, in the language of love and desire. I love you, Lord. You are my desire. I'm desperate for you. Are there exceptions to these rules? Absolutely. Are there songs that defy categorization? aren't there in any genre. <laughs> but as we've seen, the pattern has been noted at time and time again in many contexts throughout the world. We've looked at Pentecostal, uh, the praise and worship structure and the characteristics of songs found within it. Now we will ask a question that will help us get to the heart of its relationship to local and global. And that is, are musical elements considered local or global more likely to occur at particular places within praise and worship. I've spent the last two years, give or take, um, combing through accounts of Pentecostal music making around the world. And I wanna tell you about an intriguing pattern that has emerged from um, this research. And it's this, local musical styles, again, however Pentecostals define this within their context, are far more likely to be used during praise. In contrast, styles that originated in North American, British or Australian, charismatic megachurches and circulated through the Christian recording industry channels, what I am calling global musical styles, are more often the songs of choice for worship. The first time I remember learning about and kind of being intrigued by this potential pattern, at that point it was an isolated example, uh, was in, uh, in Toronto. My husband and I lived there for two years, um, over a decade ago now, and while I was there I conducted this study of the musical worship practices of Canadian Christian immigrant communities, and those were predominantly Pentecostals of diverse ethnic, racial, and national backgrounds. My study centered on Toronto's Jesus in the City Parade. This annual carnival-style parade was started in 1999 the same year that Toronto's March for Jesus, you know, went, uh, went away. But it was started by an African-Caribbean mother and daughter duo and is still going strong today. It features a succession of musical floats, each sponsored by a different church or, or group of churches that travel a rectangular route through Toronto's downtown. I had a memorable conversation with the music director of the lead float, who I will call Naomi. Naomi. 
The lead float featured a group of musicians and singers, predominantly from African Caribbean backgrounds, performing upbeat, you know, soca and calypso style praise songs. Naomi told me that for the parade, she chose praise songs that used Caribbean musical styles because these songs were so rarely sung in her church. In her view, many congregation members wanted to sing Caribbean-style songs in Sunday morning worship, but their church leaders actively discouraged those st uh, styles within their services. Naomi attended an independent charismatic church comprised almost entirely of first and second generation African Caribbean immigrants to Canada, yet weekly worship was dominated by songs from the Australian megachurch Hillsong. Naomi made a further distinction between the songs that I have always remembered and that in some ways was kind of the seed that was planted way back then, um, you know, that, that grew into this study. She told me that her church's musical leadership believed that Caribbean choruses are songs for praise, not for worship. A few years earlier, ethnomusicologist Timothy Rahman wrote about just this situation in his book on Pentecostal music making in Trinidad. In his discussion of why North American worship songs are so widespread, he observes that, quote, if a Trinidadian congregation wishes to express joyful praise during a worship service, then it's likely that a Trinidadian praise chorus will be used. If, however, that same congregation wishes to obtain a worshipful atmosphere, then it is virtually guaranteed that a North American chorus will be sung. When examining closely the accounts of music used in praise and comparing this to the music used in worship, I found that this same pattern emerges across the globe in many Pentecostal communities. I'm about to invoke, or I've already invoked, two very loaded words, local and global, and I want to acknowledge the complexity of these terms. Their meaning is constantly shifting and their definition can change from one generation to the next. With that caveat in place, here's the observation. Local musical styles, however Pentecostals define that, are more likely to be used during praise, while global styles, again, are more often the choice for worship. The stylistic dichotomization of praise and worship is not confined to those examples I've just given you of people within the African diaspora. I found uh, accounts of many other locales around the world, including Aboriginal Australia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, where praise songs, the fast songs sung at the beginning, frequently take on local musical elements, particularly instruments, vocal timbre, and other kinds of ornamentation. In her work on Romani Pentecostals in Hungary, Kinga Povedak notes three primary music genres used um, within Pentecostal worship, global, rompop, and traditional. While acknowledging the overwhelming influence of Hillsong as mediated through Hungarian megachurches, she notes that there's been a hybridization of style to a certain extent, but only of certain types of songs within Romani Pentecostal services, where upbeat praise songs often incorporate gypsy instrumentation and inspire dancing among young and old members alike. When speaking of Pentecostal worship in Brazil, Marcel Steuernagel notes the tendency for praise songs to take on a, quote, Brazilian twist featuring local rhythmic patterns and instruments. But when moving from praise into worship, he describes the increasing prevalence of a homogenous, quote, pop romantic transnational schmoozy sound. This is a direct quotation from Steuernagel, and I have his blessing to use it. Uh, and it will be described in detail in one of, uh, in this, in the ensuing section. So, we've seen, while the praise component of praise and worship often includes a variety of song styles and incorporation of the local, whatever that means to the people using it, um, by contrast, when we move to the worship segment of praise and worship, the style of the songs becomes much more homogenous. The literature is replete <laughs> with descriptions that parallel Steuernegger's memorable compound descriptor, pop, romantic, transnational schmoozy. Scholars of Pentecostalism have variously described this music as emotional, passionate, syrupy, intimate, reflective, and romantic. 
These soft rock based worship songs often emanate from global worship brands. The second generation Caribbean immigrants in Toronto that I mentioned earlier told me that songs from Australia's Hillsong were the worship songs of choice at their church. Within other communities, the worship segment may rely on charismatic choruses from the United States and Canada. For others, worship is dominated by songs from Bethel or Holy Trinity Brompton. In all these cases, Worship songs are slow ballads that a Pentecostal worshiper from Rio de Janeiro to Riga, Dresden, or Dallas would instantly recognize as the music of worship. This raises another significant question. If praise is so often variable um, and eclectic in terms of musical style, why is worship so homogenous? So in um, the next part of our discussion, I'm gonna draw on the work of several scholars of praise and worship and kind of put them in dialogue with some popular music studies scholars to suggest that the worship song has become so central across Pentecostal contexts because it draws its experiential power from the musical rhetoric of a specific globalized genre of pop rock music, specifically the pop ballad or power ballad. Within academic studies of praise and worship music, scholars often situate the music relative to mainstream commercial popular music from which the genre clearly draws heavily. Joshua Busman writes of the ways worship music relies on the musical rhetoric of pop rock music. He says, quote, there are musical and visual gestures embedded within the practice of worship music that are unintelligible without understanding the ways in which they already function in more mainstream rock and pop performance. These genres are then baptized into Christian praise and worship music, but their meaning is inextricably bound up with the musical vocabulary and modes of fan engagement that are always already syncretically linked to other popular music subcultures. So in some previous work, I have argued that within the North American context, worship songs garner their affective power from the associations of that specific secular music genre that they most closely approximate. The musical genre that serves as the worship song's musical model the world over is known as the pop ballad, or if performed by a male hard rock band, a power ballad. The pop or power ballad is a pop rock version of the time-honored sentimental ballad with historical roots in the 19th century Victorian parlor song and then later Tin Pan Alley. Popular music studies scholar Simon Frith defines the pop ballad as, quote, a form of slow love song prevalent in nearly all genres of popular music. While differing style characteristics might, you know, might uh, render these popular ballads recognizable as rock, country, R&B, or folk, songs in this category share certain musical and lyrical characteristics regardless of style. Popular music scholar Peter Manuel writes that the sentimental ballad or pop ballad in its various regional manifestations is distinguished by soft, non-percussive textures and sentimental love lyrics crooned in an intimate, sensual style. In his monograph, The Ballad in American Popular Music, musicologist David Metzer proposes six key musical elements, uh, characteristics of ballads, but puts the main emphasis on the element of tempo. All ballads have one thing in common, a slow tempo, he writes. Quote, slow tempos are a means of enhancing the way a ballad makes you feel. Tempo, slow or fast, significantly shapes the kind of emotional experiences that we get out of music. Fast songs excite, whereas throughout the history of Western music, slow tempos have been associated with the expression of tender emotions, like those of love, sorrow, or loss. Metzer offers two interpretations of the unique emotional effects of these slow songs across history, geography, and genre. He says, first, slow disrupts. It takes us out of the normal speed of life, like the mandated up-tempo top 40 radio or the hectic pace of our daily lives. Once free from that pace, you have time to think, and importantly for ballads, to feel emotions. The slow beat of a ballad invites you to pause, and the slow tempo sets the stage for reflection. 
As the song continues, time becomes more suspended and we are pulled further into the music and our emotional experience. Metzer also notes that slow tempos enhance the power of music to stir feelings by creating more time for the expressive elements to unfold, which deepens their emotional resonance. We have more time to hear them and also to respond to them. The lyrics of pop ballads generally revolve around the intimate relationship of two subjects, the enraptured and sometimes spurred or star-crossed lover and his or her beloved. Love, sorrow, and loss are the three key emotions explored within the lyrics of pop ballads. Peter Manuel notes that the pop ballad rigorously avoids reference to any social contexts or constraints, portraying instead an amorphous virtual world of the emotions. Simon Frith hypothesizes that the pop ballad has succeeded so resoundingly because it can operate on both the deep individual and corporate levels. Frith notes that pop ballads draw their experiential power from the articulation of private feeling as public emotion and that the songs function to unify an audience into an emotional community. So I think we can hear and observe many of the musical features, lyrical characteristics, and social functions of the pop ballad within the Pentecostal charismatic worship song. One obvious parallel is with lyrical content. Just as pop ballads give voice to an intimate relationship between lovers, so also worship songs are generally characterized by intimate prayers sung in the first person to the divine lover. But the similarity doesn't end with song lyrics. From the contemporary pop of Bethel Church's uh, Jesus Culture or the rock-infused power ballads of Hillsong United, worship songs borrow heavily from the musical rhetoric of pop ballads. In worship songs, key musical elements of the pop ballads uh, identified by Rishar and Metzer, including first and foremost, the slow tempo, along with steady increase of volume and texture, the gradual expansion of the melodic range and patterns of harmonic tension and resolution, these ratchet the worship song to extreme levels of emotional intensity. So I hope to have convinced you that there is a clear musical resemblance between the Pentecostal charismatic worship song and the pop ballad. It's now important to note that pop ballads, like the English language, have become one of um, the most popular genres of secular popular music around the world. This helps to explain what makes worship songs immediately accessible and experientially powerful to Pentecostals across cultural contexts. The intimate worship song has become an indispensable feature of global Pentecostal worship because, in part, it takes advantage of a globally circulating form of Western popular music that helps listeners and singers experience and express emotions like love and longing. So after all of this musical detail, you may be wondering, so what? Why does it matter? <laughs> what songs or styles are borrowed or when they're sung during worship? So I wanna spend the next few minutes explaining why it matters, examining the implications of the local praise global worship split. To do this, I wanna start with some thoughts, again from ethnomusicologist Timothy Raman, on the relationship between praise and worship in Trinidad. Raman notes that Pente the Pentecostals in Trinidad, he observed, use exclusively North American songs for the second part for worship after their praise songs, while again, relegating local musical expressions to praise. He interprets this decision by pointing out the differing significance of these activities on a hierarchy of values. In full gospel Trinidad, Raman writes, the local, today is almost invariably conflated with the physical, the body, whereas that which is not local is equated with the spiritual or the soul. This hierarchical relationship between the physical and spiritual dimensions of life is further codified through the designation praise and worship music. Praise and worship bears a coded hierarchy of value in its construction. Praise is physical, whereas worship 
is spiritual. The local and non-local dimensions of musical life are also read onto this hierarchical construction. It needs to be said that many Pentecostal practitioners and leaders flatly deny that there is, or at least that there should be, a hierarchy, <laughs> promoting what might be called a complementarian view of praise and worship. Many early North American Pentecostal promoters of praise and worship were careful to say that both praise and worship were indispensable components of any congregational worship service, and that though meditative worship may be the more, quote, serious of the activities, that it should not be valued over jubilant praise. Melvin Butler notes a similar logic within Jamaican Pentecostalism, noting that Jamaican Pentecostals describe worship as the most effective way to please God and foster communion with the Holy Spirit. Those who hold this view do not argue that praise is insignificant. Rather, they see it as an indispensable means through which a transcendent state of worship wherein participants are spiritually transformed by the presence and power of God becomes attainable. However, the idea that the praise, that praise is the means to the end of worship, even if it is an indispensable means, may undermine these careful caveats. Compounding the problem are the troubled colonial and mission histories, whereby Pentecostals and other Protestant groups before them have devalued and often demonized local musical expression. Pentecostalism is noted for its strong tendency to promote cultural rupture. In his discussion of how musical styles are racialized within Maori Pentecostal contexts, Shannon Said interviews a number of Maori Pentecostal leaders reflecting on the racialization and neo-colonial implications of musical practice. He notes a repeated concern among his interlocutors. Um, quote, that the practice of baptizing white styles of music was done within their Pentecostal church context without much criticism or skepticism, and yet attempting to do this with indigenous musical styles was perceived as dangerous and at worst demonic. This process of racializing and then demonizing music inherently places the values of white people above those of color and sends a clear message to indigenous peoples. Your practices and thus identity are not welcome in the place that affirms we are one in Christ. These actions perpetuate the presence of whiteness within church contexts, albeit under the banner of spirit and truth worship. That's an end of a quote from, from Said. Though the local praise global worship dichotomy and the value hierarchy it so often implies is found in many places in the world, it's not universal. In an intriguing exception to this value hierarchy, Michael Webb notes that in some of the Pentecostal churches he studied in Papua New Guinea, more cultural value is placed on praise than worship. Webb notes that these churches, in um, these churches, the order of Pentecostal worship is often reversed. Slower tempo songs in English precede fast tempo songs in Tok Pisin. Webb argues that the reversal is, quote, a performative religious critique of missionary era Christianity and a way that Papua New Guinean believers are asserting their autonomy from Western colonial influence. It will be interesting to follow recent indigenous Pentecostal converts like those in Papua New Guinea, whose global worship is followed by local praise, um, which seems to be an exception to the rule, to see if the order and value hierarchy continues to be inverted. As Papuan Pentecostals increasingly welcome international models into their services, when and if they come into a more sustained contact with, say, a global mega brand like neighboring Hillsong Australia, it remains to be seen whether they will increasingly conform to the model of local praise than global worship. It will be instructive to observe communities like this one that are exceptions to the pattern to ascertain whether there will be a resulting shift in their musical values and the structure of worship or whether or not their local praise songs will maintain a pride of place. So in this talk, I have used music within Pentecostal worship to tease out differences in how communities understand and value the local and the global. 
parsing praise from worship as regards liturgical, lyrical, musical, and performative aspects has revealed this pervasive pattern whereby the local is expressed through praise and transcended through global worship. The complementary actions of praise and worship allow both for a measure of contextualization and transcendence of the local context. But the presence of a value hierarchy where local musical expression, again, however this is defined, is subsumed within dominant global currents, cautions us against an interpretation of the apparent diversity of Pentecostal expression that ignores power dynamics. This pattern of local praise and global worship is a powerful norm. As with all cultural norms, it is not applicable in some contexts and is being challenged and, or subverted in other places. So I think the pattern that we've noted here raises a set of questions that it's imperative for scholars and practitioners of worship and music to wrestle with. And these questions should, ask, should be asked not only of and by Pentecostals, but also by members of the faith communities gathered here today. So I'm gonna end instead of, you know, kind of with wrapping things up neatly, instead opening things out to a set of questions for us to consider, thinking of our own congregations and traditions. So thinking of your own congregation, are there certain global songs or styles that are adopted more readily than others? Why is this? Are there places within worship where expressions understood as local are not allowed or even discouraged? What are the reasons behind this? If local songs and styles are not deemed fit to usher the worshiper into the presence of God, what does that imply about the value of their cultural, ethnic, or racial identity? Who determines the value of local musical expression in worship versus global expressions? Are the values of clergy, music leaders, and lay people in agreement or in conflict? How long does it take, anyway, for once, what was once considered foreign to become considered local? Or are non-local styles more useful precisely because they are associated with somewhere else far from here and far from the problems that we face on the ground in our church in this location. And finally, what is lost and what is gained for Christian communities as they adopt global songs and practices? Thank you for your attention. I look forward to thinking through these questions with you. Okay. Well, Monique, that was spectacular. I'm so brimming with questions myself, but it's my task to facilitate this quarter hour or 20 minutes or so of Q&A. So I'm going to throw it out to you in the uh, audience to ask questions arising from that fascinating talk. So who's going to go first? So my colleague Emily will... Um, just circulate, or uh, another colleague will circulate, a student actually will circulate with the microphone. There you go. Chris, uh, uh, no, no, that's all right. That's right. We're flexible here at LST. So, Chris, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was exceptional. But I'm wondering how the ideas here map onto historical cultural moments. So, yep. we, we have in mm. Pentecostalism the touchy-feely styles of, of our time, um, which in turn raise contrast with hymnody and the different musical styles of yesteryear and, of course, these days as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering then how, how these cultural moments map, map onto each other and, 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 of course, the place of... It's not really in, in, in this kind of style Except in as much as you can sing Amazing Grace in a yeah. slow and moving ballad. Yeah. <laughs> um, style, but. 
Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question. You know, the question of what you know, what in our cultural moment you know led to the rise of the ideas behind this music. And I think one thing to, to go to your you know question about hymnody. Of course, hymnody is uh, say also is no you know is no stranger to the kinds of critiques that have often been you know um, uh, thrown at uh, at praise and worship music. You know there are many hymns um, you know from the Victorian period, especially you know many of those written by uh, by women writers during the time that are very emotional. Very in fact you know at the at that time, people felt that these are inappropriate. These are too, whoa, way too personal, you know, way too, um, too much about, you know, me and Jesus, you know, in there. And then ironically, you know, the, the songs, the controversial songs, you know, from one century become the, you know, the lauded, the much loved traditional songs of the next century. They lose all of the, you know, kind of the sensationalism around, around their writing. So I would say that they're, you know, the, um, that's something that the evangelical movement even before um, Pentecostalism, you know, came into being, this question of, how much you know evangelicalism is very much a, a um, you know Christian movement um, where experience is valued, but how much experience do we bring into our corporate worship? How much of you know the individual's personal experience with God um, do we or should we sing about? So I think that there is you know in some ways th that's a line of continuity kind of that I've that I've drawn you know between hymnody and praise and worship music. But I would agree with you. There are there is something new going on <laughs> um, here though, and um, you know the what is what. Uh, is going on, I think I would reference, you know, the kind of music that it's linked to. So being linked in such a, I think, a profound and a uh, way that I thought was pretty easy to demonstrate, um, being linked to um, the popular ballad and all of the associations that we all maintain with that, because it is very much a live, um, you know, form of popular music with that range of associations. I think that's, that in some ways is what's new about uh, worship songs within Pentecostalism. Another question, perhaps. So I've seen a hand at the back, yes, there you go. Monique, thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering in my mind, the global idea of worship songs being derived from the romantic pop ballads, to what extent is, um, a romantic relationship, a feature of Western society rather than a kind of global phenomenon? Is this, mm. is this a, an exporting of, of the romantic idea to other parts of the world? Is that one of the reasons why it's in worship? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the scholars that I quoted um, notes that, that the, the pop ballad is the, I mean, according to him, it is the, the most prevalent globalized form of popular music, probably precisely because of its connection to the romantic relationship. And because people in many other spaces are like, ooh, that's a, <laughs> you know, that's a useful, um, you know, that's a, that's a useful genre to, uh, to borrow from. Of course, they, um, you know, with the aid of media, you know, they've heard and seen these songs in the context within films and, uh, and music videos and other things. And so I would say, well, you know, obviously, romantic love is one of those um, few, human universals, obviously we differ in how that is expressed, but the pop ballad has given people the world over a language, uh, musical and otherwise, to be able to express that. And I think that that's why it's become so, um, so popular globally. Okay. Okay, yep. Here, question here. Thank you very much, Monique, for a very stimulating lecture. Um, I found that as you were describing the resemblance between the pop or power ballads uh, with more the worship end of the, of the spectrum, as it were, I found myself assuming that, um, that the pop stroke power ballads had perhaps influenced worship. And then I questioned that assumption so I was just wondering, from your research, do you feel like it's been an influence, very simplistically, from world to church, hmm. or from church to world, because Pentecostalism perhaps hmm. 
predated some of those cultural mm. phenomena. Mm -hmm. Probably somewhere in between. But how do you how do you see the direction of travel of influence? Uh, if that makes that, sense. Yes, and it's a very good question. And I think that um, you know. It's a chicken and the egg situation in some ways. Um, you know whether I'll say whether the church came first or the world, um, you know, came first in this particular situation, because of course a lot of, as we know, pop rock music and then much of charismatic and Pentecostal music uh, were birthed out of were expressions that were heavily indebted to um, the black community in the United States, and so there's just like. Um, the spirituals and the blues, and uh, you know, gospel and R and B, and all of these um, musical styles that have constantly fed one another. Certainly, there have been people have drawn boundaries between them um, over time, but a lot of times, you know, sometimes those boundaries have, you know, have have been quite porous and have gone back and forth. I think, you know, in this. In this particular instance, I think the story that, that I am telling you know, here um, now is more a you know, kind of a world to church influence, but there's also the, the element of you know, religious experience in, um, you know, in, in pop music concerts. That has been studied. A number of scholars have said, you know, this, is, this concert is functioning like a worship service. You know, let's tick down all of the ways you know, that it resembles that it's got a set liturgy and it's got participation and people are claiming these transcendent experiences. So it really is, it's a great question. It's, hard, it, it's, it's very hard to parse, but I would say there is always kind of that, um, that circular um, influence. Yes, question at the front here, yeah. Thank you, my thanks to Monique for a really brilliant lecture. I was wondering whether in the course of your studies you've encountered places where the model is being resisted yeah. mm. and where perhaps uh, ministers or song leaders are trying to create their own local equivalent of what re releases this experience of intimacy and transcendence? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the, you know, the, the most prominent example was that was the uh, Papuan um, church, although that was still you know, local praise and global worship, albeit you know, the value hierarchy was, um, was shifted. I think there, there are some examples, um, I know I have a colleague who studies um, praise and worship as well as gospel um, in the context of Korean um, evangelicalism. And I think that she, she has mentioned, especially, especially the church of hers that loves gospel music, that has a gospel choir that is kind of, that's more aware of and cognizant of and, and talks about um, these influences that they are kind of trying to establish their, uh, their own way of doing things, but it is, it's hard. It's swimming, you know, it's very much swimming against the current in a lot of ways. Okay, yes, another question down the front here and then one at the back. Asking a question more on actual musical content. So we've gone away from hymns, which I bemoan because you've got these, I'm speaking as a musician, secondary dominance, wonderful chromatic descending passages. And we have, is there some sort of musical inadequacy that has contributed to this as well? Because we now mm. embrace this, I can play this with my eyes shut because it's just four chords. And actually it's sort of easy to lose yourself. If you haven't got to think about modulation, if you haven't got to think about <laughs> cranking up, you know, and I wonder if there is a dumbing down that has contributed to this because mm -hmm. it's so easy to lose yourself. Like every teenager goes through those, I learn chords, oh, I'm a music teacher. Um, has that contributed, do you think, and a sort of fear perhaps of embracing mm. other cultures' music, which mm. might be tonally slightly different, have different modes and... Yeah, so, okay, the question of kind of the musical, musical dumbing down, you know, if you will. And of course, the thing that, um, that churches of, we were having a conversation earlier on um, this afternoon about the difference between churches that have 
quite a lot of resources and then those that, you know, are just happy to have somebody, anybody, you know, who plays, who plays the piano or who plays the guitar. We don't care if it's just three chords, at least we've got somebody doing it. Um, so I think um, I, my response to that would be, um, I think that I think that you can play most praise songs with, you know, with, with three chords, you know, as well as, you know, as, as worship songs. So in terms of just the, you know, kind of the musical distinction between the two of those, I don't think that there's anything that goes necessarily that goes into that. But I do think um, something that I have observed, you know, while, while in this country, I have, I've seen in some ways the effect of, you know, say the, Hill songification of worship within, uh, you know, within particular communities, and when um, kids grow up and that's the only thing that they hear, it's, it, it stifles the musical imagination. So they just don't have the. It's not necessarily that they don't. They couldn't be taught, um, you know other styles, it's just that they don't have the imagination for it and there's nobody in their context that can, you know, that can help. Thank you, there's a question right at the back. There you go, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if there has been any response or, um, yeah, reflection from uh, like a Hillsong or Bethel on this phenomena and this concept. Hmm. Yes, I, I do not, um, on the very specific phenomenon that I described, I don't think so. Uh, but on kind of more general issues of, you know, we, you know, we need to, we are, we are failing, you know, the, um, the people of color in our midst. Um, we need to, or the indigenous uh, populations. I do know that, uh, that Hillsong, at least, I don't know as much, um, you know, with Bethel. I know that Hillsong has done some kind of, uh, s some conciliation work with, um, with indigenous communities in Australia that has at least involved some of you know their um, what they're teaching. I'm thinking specifically of of Hillsong College and what I know of what's going on there. That they are being made aware of some of those issues. Now, whether or not how or to what degree that gets translated into their music, that is then <laughs> sent all over the world and used as uh, you know as a model. Um, you know, I can't say that it's quite penetrated that far yet. So I saw a yes in the hat there, sir, and then Graham at the back next. Yeah, that's it. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, good evening. First of all, thank you very much for um, a really uh, engaging discussion. I'm going to try and keep this as brief as I can. Um, I think for people that are um, that really take to music and um, uh, really take to praise and worship through song. Um, it is a profound way for them to um, deepen their fellowship with God and to connect with God. But as you rightly identified in your presentation, um, there is a capacity for music to influence emotions. And so even thinking about some detracting opinions that are out there, um, just about Christianity as a whole, but even mm -hmm. detracting opinions about praise and worship, um, you know, um, questions or thoughts about it just being all emotionalism uh, come to mind, as well as then whatever detracting opinions there may be about um, songs lacking in theological substance or having theological, theologically questionable substance. So my question to you is, is there among scholarly circles like more of a discourse going on about a supposed dialectical tension there may be between mm. music's capacity to um, unduly influence and exploit and manipulate emotions mm. and versus it, its capacity to actually afford people yeah. a genuine uh, transcendent um, mm. transformative experience. I'm sorry mm. that took a long time to express. No, no, I would say wonderful questions. 
Um, you know, and I think uh, so. A couple of a couple of responses that you know that come to mind there is, yes, these accusations of emotionalism that again not new to praise and worship. You know, they've been hurled at various times throughout church history. You know, at various uh, various genres. Um, but I think um, so. Emotions as being um, as being grounded in being grounded in the body, um, and the body being created good. A lot of times, unfortunately, you know, we, in a lot of these discussions that, that want to say, oh, emotions are terrible, emotions are gonna lead you astray, um, some of those are grounded in, like, some of the, the suspicion of the body that has, uh, you know, unfortunately been, has plagued Christianity throughout a lot of its, its history. I think the best, one of the best um, and most, you know, pastoral, explanations that I've seen of the role of worship leaders related to the emotions. In Zach Hicks' book, The Worship Leader, he talks about um, emotional, the worship leader as emotional shepherd. And I love that image, is that it seems like sometimes in our discourses, when we think about emotions, you know, there's kind of this on-off that either we're manipulating people on the one hand, if we're trying to produce emotions or, you know, or we're leaving people to just do emotionally, you know, whatever you're gonna do, I'm not involved in this. But Hicks, I think, um, you know, provides this wonderful, pastoral middle ground that says the worship leader is there. People have bodies and therefore they have emotions and emotions are gonna run high and that's not necessarily you know, a bad thing. It's how, we sh how um, those emotions are shepherded and what, what we teach and model our people to, you know, to do with them. So I think there's that. You mentioned also the um, you know, discourses about, um, about theological substance in these songs. And I was, I was having a conversation, I'll say a delightful conversation sometime this afternoon with, um, with a student about this that, um, that I, I told them that it's, um, it's kind of, it's in some ways one of my pet peeves <laughs> to, um, to have someone to use theology as, you know, that song doesn't have any theology, as though theology is like, I don't know, a cup that you can, you know, pour, you know, something into. A lot of times what, um, you know, what that discourse has come down to means that song doesn't have a lot of words. <laughs> and as we know, I mean, words and theology, yes, we use words to express theology, but there are profound, deeply, you know, profoundly, theologically astute, direct settings of scripture, you know, perhaps, that have, you know, that have very few words. And so I always caution, you know, caution those, you know, when evaluating the theological, you know, substance of a song is that, you know, theological depth, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily equate to, um, equate to more words and something that has very few words like a, uh, some of these Pentecostal praise and worship choruses can be quite profound. And even if it isn't, there may be a place for it in, um, you know, in private prayer um, or confession or otherwise. So that's, just, that's, that's my two cents on the, on the theological substance discourse. I, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of our time, regrettably. I'm so, so sorry about that. But there's one more question I'll take from the floor from Graham McFarlane at the back. Um, <clears throat> our Director of Research at London School Thank of Theology. Thank you, uh, Monique, for a really stimulating and engaging topic. I think next to my colleague, Tony Lane, I've probably listened to the most Lang lectures um, by being here the longest, I guess. And yours, you, you've done yourself well. It stands well with the shoulders of some of the best. So thank you very much. My, my question is, um, to what extent is the 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 ramification of praise symptomatic of it being uh, commodified and commercialized? Mm. Or to what extent is it part of the wider um, framework of, of, of a church opening people up to receive the word of God? Mm. <laughs> that, that's a tough one. And I think I would say, you know, to that, I think we spend a lot of time trying to parse causes um, when at least, you know, this side of heaven, you know, a lot of times we're, 
we are not always going to know. Um, whether you know something you know is commercialized and then you know used for certainly God uses uh, you know God has shown God's self to come into our time to be incarnate to come in and use the existing structures. So just because something is commodified, commercialized, certainly does not mean that you know that God can't use it. But what I would caution against are these you know, sometimes flippant, um, you know, pronouncements that you sometimes hear from worship celebrities, which is, uh, you know, something like, oh, my song is all over the world and only God could do that. Just like, really? Like, do you not know anything about the, like the mechanisms of the music industry or, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. Um, there are pop artists who have their songs all over the world for, in some ways, it, using the very same mechanisms that you, in you know, your um, agreement with a Christian publishing company that has a distribution deal with one of the however many majors there are now. I think it's two or maybe two and a half. There used to be five, but um, you know, the the major uh, you know major record labels. Um, I think that we need to you know, in some ways, um, it, be cautious about over spiritualizing um, the process of musical spread, which is a lot of a lot of times what is used to legitimate global worship is that well clearly only God could do this. Okay, we really are gonna to have to wrap up in just a moment. I was wondering whether somebody would ask a question which has been burning within me. So I'm gonna indulge myself <laughs> by asking the last question. Microphone there you go, I'm, I'm pushing yes. it a bit here. But um, London School of Theology's original name was London Bible College. And you've been talking mm. about a tradition of Pentecostalism or a set of traditions yeah. and evangelicalism by association mm -hmm. that are biblicist. They are mm -hmm. traditions which would proclaim mm -hmm. that the authority of Scripture is supreme over other sources of authority. Yeah. So basically, how biblical is this distinction between praise and worship that you've been talking about? <laughs> oh dear. Asking the musicologist a theological question. And this is a church historian <laughs> asking a musicologist about a biblical status question which no doubt some of my colleagues are much better equipped to answer, but it must have been a debate. Yeah. It must have been it's, in the literature. It must, that question must tag back for Pentecostals and evangelicals about this distinction that you've talked about. Yes, well, and I think I would point you back to, you know, I just, you know, excerpted tiny little quotes from some of these, um, these early Pentecostal authors. But I think that they, you know, they really were, they were wrestling with, okay, this, um, what seems to have happened is, this practice, as so often happens, right? The practice comes first, and then we have to think about, we're just like, okay, is this, is this okay? You know, is this appropriate? Is this, and so, um, you know, so kind of reasoning back into, I think that in, in some ways it was the practice that, that led, and that later um, Pentecostal theologians went back and said, okay, can we find this in, in the Bible? And they found, you know, what, to many were compelling, um, you know, scriptural models. Certainly there are many, 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 you know, other models of worship that people in, in other traditions would use, but they found models that satisfied their own, yes, biblicist tendencies, yeah. bibliocentric. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, etymologically, I think it's a bit spurious myself, but we can carry on that to dial, you know, the distinction phenomenologically that you've yes, yeah. observed. Mm -hmm. I know you've not made a judgment on yes, yeah you know, the theological rectitude of that yeah. distinction. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, it's my task to wrap up by thanking you for a really stimulating yeah. lecture. I can tell from the quality of the questions and the response of our audience how much they've enjoyed it. Um, you've brought that quality that good scholarship should bring, which is to expound intuitions that many of us might have had mm. about what's going on in our experience of worship but you've helped to explicate and elucidate that in a mm -hmm. really, really wonderful way. So I want to thank you uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues, students, trustees, and our visitors uh, from local churches and beyond for a really great evening where you've uh, spoken to our minds, but also to our hearts and our experience. So thank you so much, Monique. It's been a pleasure to get yeah. to know you over the last day or two. <laughs> and I'm like sure that. people want to show their appreciation. Thank you.
and, and given our topic tonight, let me just close in prayer with a word of prayer. God of grace and truth, we thank you for the presentation tonight. We thank you for speaking through Monique. We thank you for her scholarship and your gifting her in that way. We pray, Father God, that from what we've heard tonight, we may reflect on our own practice of worship, our own approach to worship and to praise. And we pray, Lord, within our communities, we may honour you more faithfully as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.